So, uh, good morning everybody and thank you for joining me today. Um, my name is James Clark and I currently go by the job title of Agile and Lean Coach. I'll let you decide what that ends up being. Um, a disclaimer for this though, um, I'm not a psychologist, I just want to put that out straight away. Um, I'm not claiming to be either. Um, I'm just passionate about a particular topic. I've been studying uh, this for about three years now and um, I found it highly useful for me as an individual to find out more about myself and also put myself in team situations where it's enabled me to hopefully show other people what these things are as well. So, the talk is called How Our Intuitions Deceive Us, also known as uh, What Your Gut Feel basically is. Now I'm going to show you six everyday illusions which will impact your daily lives I'm going to let you experience them yourself as well, so it'll be a bit of an interactive session. And I'm hopefully going to share some ideas on how you can potentially avoid them, or uh, how you can exploit them. It's up to you how you're feeling on a particular day. So, um, another disclaimer as well, I'll just say for this. There are some exercises in this which you may have already done before. If you have done them before, um, please just pretend you haven't, so the rest of the group might actually be able to go through them as well. So, these are the six uh, daily illusions that we will cover. The uh, illusion of attention, memory, confidence, knowledge, and potential. So, the first one up, hopefully if tech works now, I'm going to play you a short video, and I have got a speaker so you can kind of hear what goes on as well. So, as I said, if you've seen this stuff before, just pretend you haven't seen it before. This is a test of attention. Can you hear that? Count how many times the players wear the one and pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? How many passes did you all get? Well, I've just given the answer. <laughs> <laughs> 15 passes? Anybody get any less? Any more? 14. 14, okay. I heard uh, a couple of giggles, so... Did you see the gorilla? But did you see the gorilla? Yeah? Hands up who didn't see the gorilla. Okay, didn't see the gorilla. Do you believe me that there was a gorilla? Or do you think I'm just messing with you? I didn't believe you. You believe me, are oh, you so kind? There isn't a gorilla. <laughs> now you've seen it, it's really obvious, right? You can't unsee it. <laughs> this video is private. Okay, so the illusion of attention occurs because we think that we see more of the world than we actually do. As humans, we think that we're, we're quite smart at seeing everything that goes on around us, and in actual fact, we only see a really small percentage of the world that's in front of us. Just as you did with that video, something can be right in front of you, you can still miss it. But it's not just us, okay? Just because you didn't spot the gorilla, you're not alone. There's a load of experts and some really experienced people out there that also forget and don't see these things as well. So I'm going to share a couple of stories with you. This first one uh, is based on a, a NASA um, research scientist who is experimenting with how digital technologies can help pilots, um, particularly commercial airline pilots who have to spend many years obviously training to become a pilot, obviously, and they're in charge of hundreds of people's lives. So you'd expect that they're able to, to do their job properly. In the case of this particular experiment, they were put in a heads-up digital display in front of the pilot. So you don't have to look around the cockpit anymore. It's literally just in front of you. Everything you need, speedometer, like the elevation you are, everything of that nature. So he gets two experienced pilots into, the, into a simulator, luckily for us. And they've flown at this airport before. They've landed at it multiple times. The only weird condition with this is there was thick fog, okay, so they couldn't see the runway 
just before they landed. But they did have enough time to react. So as they're going to land, pilots thinking everything's normal, it's fine, the NASA research scientist cancels the experiment. Doesn't tell them why, just cancels the experiment. They're a bit unsure of why it is, so he takes them into a room, shows them a replay of what's happened, they still don't see what was wrong, and he has to point out to them that as they were about to land, there was another plane which was essentially on the runway and they would have crashed into it if he hadn't have aborted the mission. And when they were asked, why did you do this? They didn't have an answer. The sim simple one, somebody said, I didn't see it. Do you think I didn't see it? Like, is a good answer if you're flying the plane and there's a massive plane in front of them, a runway in front of you. No. And they didn't believe it until they showed the video as well. So it's just a short story on how actually we can still miss things. And they shouldn't have missed it because they've got a heads up display in front of them, right? That was the hypothesis that they had. Again, an example here is a, um, is a nuclear submarine commander who was performing some exercises. Um, I'm not a submarine expert, so I can't go into the like, details of what this was. But basically, you have to do a really deep dive in a maneuver, right? Which is to get as deep as you can as quickly as possible. But before you do that, you use a periscope to obviously see what's around you, and then you descend. So it performs all of the maneuvers you need to do to descend, and then you have to do the reverse, which is to basically go up as high as you can, as quickly as, as you can, and the submarine breaks through the water really violently. Uh, in this case, when it done it, uh, it come up and split a Japanese fishing vessel that was 200 feet long in half and killed nine people. That's a true story, that, that happened. When they actually asked, again, there's a 59 page document which went into why this Japanese fishing vessel had been split in half. They did find some problems, okay, in the process. There wasn't enough communication that had gone down, down the chain, um, but ultimately what they found was the commander was at fault again. There's no way that he should have missed a 200 foot fishing vessel in the periscope. He had enough time, it's documented what he'd done, but he still missed it. So still an experienced person that can miss something when it's right in front of you. And the reason why he missed it is because he wasn't expecting it to be there. So that's, in our daily lives, when we see things and we do stuff as a team, you can't see the solution to a problem, the chances are, is, as the saying goes, is right under your nose. Again, it can also happen to, again, more experienced people, radiologists. Their job is literally to spot things wrong in an x-ray. Okay, so if I'm looking for broken bones, I'm going to be looking for broken bones, I'll probably find the broken bone. But what happens if there's something else in there that's more severe? Do any of you watch House or have watched House before? Yeah? Okay. So you know basically what happens is all of the doctors go and do this, they don't find anything. House comes along and he's always got this bizarre reason of why somebody's ill or something like that and he solves the problem, right? This is basically saying the same thing. It's that doctors are normally aware of this illusion, right? They know that this thing happened, which is why they'll have multiple people looking for the same thing. But yet we still miss it, and especially in America, lots of people get sued as a result of this, because it's negligence, or perceived to be negligence. Sorry about this. So I'm gonna do one last video for this one again. So you know there's a gorilla, right? So there's definitely a gorilla in this one. I'm not lying, there is a gorilla. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. So yeah, I didn't ask you, but did you get did you get 16 passes this time? Yeah. So you were all counting because you knew that you had to count. You knew there was a gorilla. You all saw the gorilla, right? Yeah. Anybody notice anything else? What did you notice? Yeah, one of the girls left. One of the girls left. Anything else? Curtain change color. Curtain change color. Anybody else see those? No. 
Do you believe that? Do you, do you reckon they're just messing about here? Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half this the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, hopefully you can still hear me. I'll just shout a bit now. Obviously, that, that mic is doing my That's much better. Much better, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, we've just given you two examples of something, right, where I showed you there was a gorilla. I've explained to you that you can miss things in front of you. I've given you an alternate version and we can still miss stuff that's in front of us. So the all important question, why do we miss them? Um, well, I've already alluded to it a minute ago, you don't expect things to be in front of you. If you're looking for something else, then you might miss everything else. So if I just turn around like I just did and said, look for the gorilla, you'll find the gorilla because you've seen it, but you'll miss other things that are there. Um, <coughs> We're actually built for a slower pace as human beings, right? So if you think, well, actually, if this, if this was such a dangerous illusion, if people die from flying planes all the time or, you know, splitting in half submarine, not submarines, fishing boats, why didn't our ancestors die of, basically, this illusion? Like, if they were always looking for things that were hunting them and stuff like that, why didn't they die out? And the answer is actually because of the, the modern world. We've got so much stuff around us right now that, they were able to see a little bit more and they weren't impacted by things that we were. So if you think, if you're walking down the street and you see something happening, you've got time to react to these sort of things because you can see more of the world that's going on around you at a slower pace. If you start driving a car at 100 miles an hour down the motorway and you get an unexpected thing of like a bird flying in front of you because you're not looking for that and you're actually looking for a car that's in front of you, then obviously consequences can be a little bit more dangerous. So. How can we avoid it? Uh, there's no simple answer to it, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, if you wanted to remove it, you'd have to remove basically focused attention. So you would have to have an example like the gorilla, <coughs> you just did with counting the number of balls, but in your head you would have to say, well the outcome isn't that I want to know what the number of balls is. You just have to count them as well as seeing everything else that was around you. Um, taking the first step. So this is the first step of realising that this illusion exists and it can influence on a daily basis. Technology can help you, okay, but you have to be mindful that the technology will only help us for what we program it to see. So it obviously won't help us if we don't know what it's programmed for. So I'm going to do uh, another quick test with you. So this is going to be about the illusion of memory. <coughs> Um, I've got a confession to make, which is I forgot to bring uh, paper and pens for this, but luckily we've got sketch pads and an amazing pen to use as well. So um, the first thing, this is the illusion of memory. So hands up, who thinks they've got a good memory? Yeah? Yeah? Sure. Thanks for the volunteers there. <laughs> There's probably a theme now that you might pick from out, out from this, right? So we're going to do a, a quick test. There is a prize. Okay, this is the prize. This is one of many books that I've read for this, but I thought it'd be quite nice if you could, uh, you could have this. Now, before you write anything down, no cheating, okay, there's going to be a list of 15 words. I'm going to show you them for a minute, and then I'm going to ask you to start writing them. If you can show me that you've got all 15 of them, you win the prize. If somehow, Marvel Board, if you have it, I will get you another copy and I'll send it to you, okay? So, remember the list. This is your list. I'll give you a minute from now to try and remember the list.
stop. You remember all 15? If you would like to attempt to write down 15 that you think that there is, or even make up 15, it's up to you. <laughs> Some severe concentration going on. I can see it in the faces. Let me give you 15 more seconds. Okay. So, who's got 15 to start with? Anyone? No? 14? 13? 13. Okay, we've got 13. So you're currently in the lead to win the book. I've just changed the rules. <laughs> okay. So, who remembered a few that they think was from the beginning? Yeah? A couple from the end? Who had sleep? Who's got sleep? Oh. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, sleep's not in that list. <laughs> so normally about 40% of you will end up obviously getting the word sleep. The reason is because you, uh, the way that your memory works is you basically fabricated it. That list is designed on purpose to make you think that the word sleep is in it, because it's a bunch of words that you would associate with sleep, and therefore your memory and your mind, and you think that you know quite a bit about sleep and what you would do, so you're actually just filling in some patterns and, and popping bits together. So, when you had 13, did you have, did you have sleep in your list? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Anybody have 12? <laughs> with sleep? No sleeps? No sleep, okay, right. Should we have a look, see what you both got? And we'll, we'll go back out. Okay. Right. Trusting you now to tick off what you've got and to also tell me what else you've added into it as well. I had somebody the other day say breakfast. I don't know where that came from, but I'm guessing they were hungry. I had a week and then I thought, no, I was weak. Okay. So you got 12, yeah? yeah? Anybody beat 12 correct answers? Well, I, I took the picture, so I got 15. You got 15? Okay. Anybody else have 12? The answer? All correct. But they're both correct answers. All of you 12, yeah? Yeah? Okay, so I've got to get one of you another book. But afterwards, if one, whoever gets to me first can have this and then the other one. Just give me your email or something and I'll send you, I'll send you a book. Cool. So traditional ways of thinking about how our memories work, we think it works like this, like a data center, like storage. We think that any given moment we can just go up and we can go and get a, a, a memory which is recorded in HD, we've got all of the sound and it's completely accurate. Okay? Our memories don't actually work like that, it's obviously not a surprise to you now with some of the stuff that you've gone through. Um, our memories rely on what we know of a particular topic at any given time, and then what we do to fill in the missing pieces or to basically fill in the gaps as you've just done with the words. Um, our memories don't get full, so that's a, another illusion that we think that, well, we can't remember something because we haven't got enough capacity or something like that. Um, our memories actually rely on something like this. So, a little pun, not technical, but I thought that was as technical as I could probably get. <laughs> 
Um, we all forget things, right? We know that we forget things, but yet we think that we have good memories. I mean, I'm not going to judge anyone, but has anybody ever forgot to pick their kids up from school? <laughs> no, maybe not as extreme as that, but maybe, you know, getting the laundry or something like that, okay? <laughs> And now the reason why we think that we would forget that is because we think that we're, we've not got enough storage or maybe that we've overwritten that memory with something else. Whereas the reason why we don't actually remember some of this is because it's potentially how we feel at that time. If you've got an emotion that's really connected to a particular memory, you go a bit dark for a moment here, but you can probably remember uh, a really sad time in your life, right? And you will think, that the memories that you have of that time are really vivid. You can still remember it like it was yesterday, as the saying goes. Um, every time we recall that memory, that memory actually changes. We add bits to it, we take bits away from it, and I'm going to share with you an example of my personal uh, examples of a, of a particular memory as well. So, why do you miss them? As I said, we think that we have a better memory than we do. How we perceive memory is wrong, so we think it's a, a storage base when it actually isn't. Our pre-existing knowledge obviously shapes it and it, your unconscious mind, so all of your emotions and things like that and the environments around you. So you might remember how something smells, how something tastes, not necessarily the price of it on a menu. So do you think you can trust your memories now? Here's the big, the big one. Um, so false memories is the first thing, which is when we add words into it or we recall something else. There's a book that I referenced at the end, her name's uh, Dr. Julia Shaw. I'd highly recommend reading that. Basically, she hacks people's minds. She puts false memories into people, as a like scientist, not like <laughs> goes out there and hacks people's minds on purpose, okay? But what she, she does is she gets you to believe that you've committed a crime. And you can actually see from her learnings how uh, maybe some not so uh, nice regimes in the world might convince people to commit, well, admit to crimes that they haven't committed, basically, for particular answers. So I'm going to tell you about the miracle of Rome now, okay? So, story, uh, my little brother, he's six years younger than me, um, so he's 24, and at the time he was probably about 18, and um, we'd gone to Rome, and this was my dad's 50th birthday, and just before this, my brother had been quite ill, like, and I always thought he was making it up, because there was no visible symptoms to anything that had happened, constantly um, complaining of pain, and always going to a &E. And essentially, we never found anything that was, that was wrong with him. Um, and I call it the miracle of Rome, because when we're in Rome, we come back, all of this like illness basically disappeared. Okay? Now, I relate this due to an event of drinking some water. Now, there's three different versions of this story. First one is, I don't know the truth anymore. Okay, so, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. My wife is adamant of a particular story, and obviously, my brother is going to be very defensive about the story that I tell you as well. Um, hi Daniel as well for when you watch this. Um, so we're in Rome and we just checked into the room and my, I'll tell you my memory first, sorry, which is uh, we checked into the room and my brother's come out of the toilet with a full bottle, a two litre bottle of water, which was empty when he went in there. And I thought nothing of it and like, I've gone in and I've looked at the sink and I've gone, that is a really, really small sink. How on earth has he filled a two litre bottle of water? That's really impressive. I've turned around and I've gone, toilet? Probably not. B day. <laughs> I'm sure he's not filled a bottle of water up from the B day. So I believe that I've gone and asked him, have you filled this bottle up from the B day? And I think he said yes, and I now think he's drank it, and I think that actually the B day water from Rome has cured him of all of his, his illness, okay? So my wife tells me that my version of the story is 100% true. That definitely happened. She's in hysterics every single time it happens. My brother, of course, doesn't believe that that happens. He thinks what happened was he went in and asked us, can I use the small tap that's in the toilet? He didn't know what B-Day was at the time. And we said, no, you can't. It's B-Day. Basically, this is where all of the story has come from. I don't, I don't know the truth anymore. And I think I made it up. I actually think that I started that story, he's been bullied for like the last six years, whatever it is, about drinking water out of the B-Day. And I do feel a little bit guilty that it might have been me that's made this up. I think I might have hacked my own memory that's basically in there. So we've covered off that obviously you can have a false memory. As 
the miracle of Rome, as I've said to you, which is I don't even know the truth anymore, so I can't trust my particular memory on that one. Um, and I have no proof of what happened. It's very rare that anything's actually recorded, that we can really recall and say this is what's happened. I've told you about um, Dr. Julia Shaw, who can hack your memories as well. So if a little bit more convincing, I might be able to get my little brother to admit to drinking out of B-Day water instead, if I keep telling him he's done it. <coughs> um, unfortunately, we can't remove this one. Eventually, there will be a tip that I'll tell you of what we can do, right? But you just have to be aware that this happens. The way that you think of your memory isn't able to be in recalling this with absolute clarity. So make sure that you challenge yourself on these things and seek other people's opinions on what they thought happened at that particular event. So the illusion of confidence is twofold. So the first one is um, we love confidence. It's just a thing that we like as, as human beings, right? We love confidence in ourselves, first and foremost. We generally think that we've got better skills, better knowledge than we actually have. But yet, it never stops us from attempting something, right? If I asked you now, can you fly a plane, unless we've actually got some pilots sitting <laughs> here, most of you will go, no, I'll give it a go. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And we believe in our confidence. So, does anybody play chess here? You do play chess. Okay, well, I need to be really careful how I explain this now then. Right, so the chess rankings, you know how that works? Yeah, okay, so chess rankings. It's said that the chess rankings is one of the closest things you get to being completely accurate that will show what your actual skill of playing chess is. Now the way that it's done is you're awarded points in tournament conditions, but obviously beating someone who's higher than you, beating someone lower than you, and obviously you can get the same points. So bearing in mind that is pretty much completely accurate, and I'm not like trying to give you with some sort of illusion and then say, no, no, it's not. They're saying that this is as close as you can possibly get to being accurate. In a survey of chess players, how many of them do you think, as a percentage, said, yes, my score accurately reflects my abilities? To shout out, you think? Two. Two. Two percent. <laughs> Close. It's only 15%. Okay, so 15% of these tournament chess players basically think that this pretty much near perfect way of saying what the skills was, was relevant to them. So um, as a result, they actually done two experiments off the back of this. They came back in a year and they assessed those people, that 75% of people who said that their skills would be higher. Do you think that they were closer in a year? Or about five years? No. So they came back in five years even after that and essentially they'd overestimated their confidence and no one was anywhere near what they thought they would be. Anybody seen this before? The Kruger effect? Yeah? Okay, cool. So just a, a nice representation of actually that most of us, including me, when we feel like we're quite confident in someone, we're probably sitting on top of Mount Stupid. And then, when you actually do know something and somebody else comes into the room and speaks really confidently about it in front of you, you go, uh, I don't think I know as much as I do know. Right? And you end up falling down into the valley of despair and you challenge your whole life, your whole purpose of why am I here? Um, and then obviously over time you start to realise that actually that isn't necessarily the case. It's not just confidence we have in our own abilities though. We love confidence in others. If I show you this picture, okay? Now you walk into a room and you're ill and this lady's there and she basically pulls out everything from in her head, based on what you tell her, what's wrong with you and how to cure you, would you feel pretty confident in her decisions? Because she's a doctor. I think most of us would, even if I was saying this illusion, I would trust this person's opinion. What happens if she went, hang on a minute, let me just double check and consult some documents, because I want to be 100% sure that the pills that I'm going to prescribe you aren't going to kill you and they're going to cure you. How would you feel then? Not, not very confident, right? But actually, now you know this illusion exists, wouldn't you be more confident yeah. if somebody's going to go away and double check and make sure? Well, 
That would be because in this example, that person realizes that confidence doesn't equal their knowledge, right? It just means that we think that we can predict things. So a couple of stories we're going to show you as well. So obviously we're quite familiar with this and this. Can anybody tell me maybe the correlation between the two? So if I told you the story that uh, many, many centuries ago, we were all believed that the world was flat, and you must have heard that story a long time, and then we proved that it was obviously a sphere. That's also not true. So it was only like in 1880 there was a small group of people that actually believed that the world was flat. Way back to like ancient Greeks, knew it was a sphere, and they've always been able to predict it was a sphere. The sundial was one of the examples that they've told us about it. And my hypothesis, if the world was flat, all the cats would have knocked everything off by the time now. So we know it's definitely not. What about this one? Correlation between these two? Elephants are Are they? Okay. Cool. Elephants aren't necessarily scared of mice. Uh, Dumbo might believe us that that's actually the case. Um, elephants have really bad eyesight, and anything that's small that's in front of them is going to startle them. So even if that was a bird that was moving in a rapid movement, it will scare them. It's not just that they are scared of mice. How about this one? That. What do we know about a bat? What's the most common thing that people tell us? Disease. Disease, drinks blood. Blight. Blight night. Blight night, yeah. Come on, Dracula. Blind. Blind, yes, there we go. It's all right, when I've done the practice run, this basically happened as well. I just had vampire, 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 <laughs> rabies. Um, <laughs> so, bats. Do we actually think that they're blind? No, yeah, the majority of species actually have really, really good eyesight. The reason we believe that they're blind is because they use sonar, right? Which is actually just another way that they're trying to find prey. It's not because they can't see anything at all. So, how can you avoid it? At this point, do you want to stay inside your house and never leave again because the world is a lie, right? The, everything that we thought about ourselves is a lie. You can't trust anything, anyone, ever says again, even yourself, um, which obviously isn't true, of course. Just don't overestimate your own skills. Okay? Now I keep saying, obviously, that <coughs> I'm trying to give you real answers. I can't do anything that says, if you go and follow X, Y, and Z framework, which we know won't work anyway, right? Because it needs to fit to your context. Just challenge yourself on this. Every time you think that you could do something, don't let it stop you from doing it, but just actually think, actually, how good are you at it? Is there somebody else in your team which actually might be better at it than you, and you should just probably leave them to it or help them? And ask more questions. Just ask questions to understand something. So if you're not quite confident that a doctor is going to double check and say, I'm not quite sure what's wrong, ask. Ask why. Don't just say, I'm never going to that doctor again. They don't know what they're on about. Okay? So on number four. Illusion of knowledge. So we like to think we know it all. It's like, I know, I know, I've been there, I've done that, I've got the t-shirt, um, I don't need you to tell me how we need to do things. So again, this is where the sketchbooks have come in handy, right? So most of you will know what a bicycle is, hopefully. Right? It's one of the most simple objects that you can do. On a scale of um, one to seven on your paper, I want you to rate how well you think you know a bike works. So one being not very well, and seven obviously being I'm an absolute expert, I go out cycling every weekend, and I know how a bike works. So if you do that just for me for a second, so one to seven. Do we have any sevens in the room? No sevens? Six or seven. Six or seven, okay, that's cool. I was about to say, that's a first that I've had that. <laughs> Go along with it, everyone's a seven, right? <laughs> cool, so what I'm going to ask you to do now is I'm going to ask you to draw the bike. Okay, so I want you to draw a bike. You can't draw. You can't draw. <laughs> that's okay, you heard what Fran said anyway, right? It's just yeah. triangles and circles, that's all you need to do. 
So I'm going to ask you to draw the bike, and I'm going to give you a minute to do it, so it doesn't need to be 100% perfect, but draw the bike how you think it works. Okay? You've got a minute from now. Okay, and stop. So, who's got a completed version of the bike? Anyone? Yeah, let's have a look. We'll go over it for number six and seven. One in control. Bad, not bad. What else? <laughs> have you got? That's okay, that works. Anyone else? Possibly the smallest one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Not bad, not bad. Okay. So I want to double check whether your bike has these things. Okay, so remember this was whether you know how a bike works. So let's just double check. Do you have brakes? Yeah, everyone got brakes? Yeah. Everyone got a chain? Yeah. Is everyone's chain connected from the middle to the back, or has anybody got a chain that runs the whole length of the bike? <laughs> All the way. How are you going to turn the bike? <laughs> Straight lines. What about the frame? Is that attached to the front and the back of the wheel, or have we actually got gaps? No? Rule on that. Cool. What about spokes? Everyone got spokes in the wheels? Yeah? Okay, cool. And the last one, the pedals. Has everybody got pedals? Yeah? Now, are the pedals outside of that loop? So do they come outside of here when you're diagram? Are they outside of the chain? Yeah? If they're not, and they're the inside of it, how on earth are you going to actually turn around that chain? Okay, now you can do this example with any other normal object that you think like let's take a toilet for example we all think that we know how a toilet works right you just push the flush on that would you be able to describe all the inner workings of why when you push a flush this happens the float goes up again we think that we could describe something a little bit more because we think that we know how something works whereas we don't actually know why it works if any of you fell to some of those examples but it's not just you, okay? There's an Italian designer who ran an experiment uh, called Velocipedia. Look it up on the images, they're quite funny. Uh, he basically canvassed 300 people, and his conclusion was nobody in the world can draw a bike accurately. Okay, now we've proven that actually we can be pretty close to it. So here's some of the drawings. As you see, the chain running the whole length here. Pretty rigid frame, and what he did is a concept artist. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Another one for you. This one. <laughs> there you go. He's actually added some spokes in that one. So. This illusion of knowledge basically says that the more knowledge that we've got, the more accurate that we think that we can be. You see that probably every single day in your teams when somebody says, uh, I've done this before, I know exactly how long it's going to take. It obviously misses a complete context of is it the same people, is it really the same problem that you're doing, did you do it in the same way? We just think that we know more. So because we've got more accuracy, we think that we're better at predicting the future. Whereas what it actually does is the more knowledge we've got, the more confident we feel in something. And when we feel more confident, we think that we can predict the future. Let's just look at the weather. Right? I mean, okay, we're all right at the moment. It's supposed to be like 27 degrees for the whole week. Right? We're pretty confident in that, but something changes straight away and our confidence is completely moved. It's because we think that we've got a forecast that something will happen. So, can you avoid it? Much like, obviously, your confidence for yourself and in others, you just need to be aware that it exists and that sometimes we suggest that we know more than we actually do, which is why at the start I tried to give you a disclaimer by saying I'm not a psychologist. 
I'm not an expert in this by no means. The people who I learn this from, I would consider to be the experts. I'm just merely sharing some of their learnings. Watch out for what you say, and obviously what others say to you. So when you're sitting in a room or you're talking again to your teams, just be mindful about how you might present yourself as being really confident. You know we've got those people that probably sit in our rooms a little bit louder than everybody else try and convince you that their idea or their opinion is the right one. I don't need to say that this illusion exists for you to be aware of that, right? You know that anyway. But also just watch how that may happen as well. And your knowledge needs to be validated, okay? So even what I've just shown you with some of these, don't necessarily believe it. Go and research it. Go and see whether elephants really are scared of mice. I mean, I'm not trying to lie to you. That's what I learned from this. But don't just take everything at face value. And again, acknowledge that you might be wrong, which is one of the hardest ones, right? If you look back at all the other illusions that we've had, we might miss things, so we might have not known. Our memory might have fabricated something completely different, and we might not be as knowledgeable about it as we might think that we are. So the illusion of cause, I would call it AKA jumping to conclusions. So I like this one, this is the first one, right? The first of like three versions of cause. So what do we see in the toast? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. What about the pepper? Okay. Now, this particular illusion of cause is because we try to spot patterns in things. Okay? Now we think that there's a picture of Jesus in the burnt toast. And we think that, obviously, it's a picture of Sylvester Stallone in, in the pepper. <laughs> there isn't, right? We just think that there is. We're filling in a gap that's between us. Now, it's not to say that this illusion isn't necessarily a good thing. There's a lot of people that take advantage of this. Stockbrokers. People of that nature, right? In some scenarios, they make an awful lot of money by trying to spot the patterns in between stuff, right? And gambling on it as a result. You could say it's gambling. They've got 50-50 chance. But... They're employed to do it, but obviously it can go the other way. They can lose lots and lots of money as well. The other illusion of this part is we think that we know why it happens because. So we think that there's a sequence of events. So we think that if something has happened here, it means that this end result that happened over here must have happened because of this. Now in this particular example, like, it's easy to say that when a domino is knocked over, right, you will be able to see that all the dominoes are on the floor when the last one's on there. So you can validate that. You can actually see that there was a chain of events that happened. There's plenty of scenarios where that won't happen. Like if you think of football, I always use a football example, right? I mean, not to talk about VAR because we could be here for ages with that. But a penalty wasn't given, let's say, right? And you always heard a commentator say, if that penalty was given, would have changed the game completely. We don't know that. We think that it does. If a penalty was given, there's still a 50-50% chance whether he would score or whether he would miss. But as a result, we think even if they missed the penalty, it would have changed the whole course of the game. Well, it might have changed a few individual moments, but it might not actually impact the whole end result. There's a chance that it could, of course. A couple of other examples for you as well. Does anybody know if I said injections and children, what I might be talking about? Cause and autism. Okay. So there's studies now which show that this is not true. Okay. So it has been proven that that isn't true. The reason why we think it's true is because um, autism comes about in children at the time that they start engaging with other people, well, with other children, right? And that's primary. Primary school, basically, that would happen when you really have meaningful interactions with people. And because that's when you start interacting with people, all of these symptoms start to come out. But what happens a few months before you go to primary school? You get your injections. And people start to think there's a pattern that because they've had their injections, when they start seeing these symptoms, it must be because there was injections that happened. And we know it's not. We know now it's just because of the age that those children are there. And the cause and correlation is just that. that it, you know, there's nothing that's there. It's just coincidence. About this one. <coughs> Cold weather and arthritis. Yeah. Now this one, 
hasn't yet been proven or disproven, right? So I was trying to research this, and I found too many articles which suggest that it hasn't been proven for me basically not to feel confident standing in front of you saying, this has been removed. But there's a pattern here, and we think that this is actually back to the illusion about memory, you know, how we fabricated things by saying it's cold, so I remember feeling extreme cold because of how it made me feel on that day as an emotion. We don't know if there's a causal correlation with this one yet. Yeah? It could just be coincidence. But yet, yeah, we still believe it. So I want to show you one more video. And this is from The Simpsons. So if you the Simpsons fan. out there, that's the reason why we don't have any bears. The same example, at least the same, well, you know, don't have any tigers if I have this rock. If we explore a little bit further, the whole concept behind showing this idea is actually there aren't any bears in Springfield. Like, it was a, it was a one-off event, and they've overreacted to it, right? So the whole reason of why there aren't any bears there is not because of the bear patrol. It's because there aren't any bears there. It was a one-off, right? It, it was just a coincidence. There's no cause and correlation between the two. And just because we're in Wales, I thought I'd bring up the curse of Aaron Ramsey. Have any of you heard of this before? No? Okay. Basically, there's a cause and effect here. Aaron Ramsey scores a goal. People die. <laughs> Okay, and here's some examples. Aaron Ramsey scores. The day after, Osama bin Laden dies. I think he was cheered for that one, right? Aaron Ramsey scores. He killed Steve Jobs. He also scored again. This time he killed Gaddafi. Then he's killed Whitney Houston. Uh, he's killed a basketball player. He killed Paul Walker. He took Robin Williams from us. <laughs> and then lastly, um, you know, he took Bowie and Alan Rickman away from us as well. What an asshole. <laughs> right? So it's, do you think there's actually any relationship between these two things? No. Unless he's a secret assassin like, on the side, I doubt it, right? It's just a coincidence. Now, I'm using this particular example here because I haven't researched it myself. So I purposely chose it. I don't know whether it's true. And I want to give you an example of obviously, as you know, not everything you read is true. This comes from the World Health Organization. Somebody you think that you should be able to trust, right? It's saying that 50 grams of processed meat a day, like obviously bacon, will give you cancer or increase your chances of cancer by 80%. We've heard that one, right? Now, the tip for this one is that an experiment that they could have run which was controlled. Has every single person in the world been in a controlled experiment and said, actually, by this, we think that it will increase cancer? Now, don't get me wrong, we've probably got scientists here that have picked a different demographic of all these people to try and do an experiment for you and then scale it up, right? Don't always believe those things. If there's something in it, it's always clickbait, actually, to be honest, of misleading titles. Do this and it will increase something by 100%. Um, I was going to make a scaling agile related joke, but I was going to say, do save and be agile, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you won't. Um, I don't know the audience that well enough in case I've offended you. <laughs> like, sorry, that's the truth. Um, and so as a result of it, just challenge basically what's there. So can you avoid it? Sometimes we're too good at trying to spot the patterns. We think that we know why something's happened. So again, what you have to do is stop yourself and think a little bit more about why has this happened? Is it really just a coincidence? Is it Aaron Ramsey? 
if you remember that, just um, is it an Aaron Ramsey moment, basically? That's all you need to remember for this particular one. We can remember stories. So when people sit here and tell you about something, you're more likely to remember a story because you can add your own bits into it. If I show you a bunch of statistics, you find them boring. So just be wary about the story and the statistics that sit behind it because sometimes there's a bit more in it. So the last one is the illusion of potential. Has anybody heard of the Mozart theory before? No? Okay, cool. Uh, this has been recorded, so disclaimer again. I believe Disney own the rights to this. They may or may not, okay? So go and double check it. But what I believe is that Disney own the rights to Mozart's music, and they play it in children's toys. So next time you go home, if you've got young children and it's doing a lullaby or something like that, see whether it's Mozart's music. Now the reason they do this is because they believe that listening to Mozart's music will increase your intelligence. Matt, right, do you honestly think listening to Mozart's intelligence, well, music would increase your intelligence? Someone somewhere has said that the same wavelengths that come out of his music is the same wavelengths that our brains are. This is why you're supposed to pay it to, to unborn children or to young children. Okay? It's trying to tap into the fact that we can get faster intelligence by listening to some music. You can't do that. This one as well is uh, that we've also got a gap in our brain. Heard that before? Untapped reservoirs of knowledge that you can always get to. We only use 5% of our brain, there's another 95% that's available to us, and we can fill that really fast. Not true. Damn it, yeah. <laughs> anybody got a Nintendo DS? And has anybody played any of the brain training games on them? Yeah, not for about 10 years, but yeah, it's the best example I've got, right? <laughs> okay. So this one, in a particular example that I'm going to give you is, um, they ask elderly generations, so like people much older than us, of course, right, yeah, to do this, to train their brain so that they don't lose any of their cognitive abilities. So we think if we train ourselves, we'll be able to keep going. Nintendo obviously have done an amazing job at marketing this and actually telling people that you can get this knowledge by just playing some games. Research suggests that actually it's better to go and walk outside for 30 minutes to actually keep yourself healthy. It's about your health instead, right? And it's not just Nintendo, right? If you think of first-person shooter games or something like that, people think if you play those, then you're going to end up with a better perception, like peripheral vision, because you're looking for different things. Or if you're going to play Sudoku, you're going to be really good at maps, right? Now, in some of those cases, you are going to learn skills. You can train yourself. You can't train yourself very fast, and some of those skills are untransferable. Like, if I started doing Sudoku, it doesn't mean I'm going to walk into a bank and become, like, chief finance officer or something like that, right? Just because I know I can count. It doesn't mean that I can transfer those skills. So, we do have a tremendous potential for increasing our learning abilities. Everybody in this room and everybody outside of it can learn. You can learn something new every single day. What you can't do is learn that really, really fast by using some of the gimmicks that happen there. So you can't learn it by playing games. Yeah, sure, you might learn a bit of a skill, but you, might be able, you won't be able to transfer it anywhere else. So can you avoid it? Of course, you, as we said, you can increase your mental capabilities. You can avoid it, this one, so you can avoid it. Obviously, you have to realise that practice makes perfect in this case, keep learning. Challenge your knowledge that you've got. Don't be overconfident in some of the things that you've got. And as we said, like, for example, playing chess. It doesn't make you smarter, it just makes you better at chess. So all of these illusions, I don't want to say you can't do anything about them, because you can, right? That might be the message that you're getting through this, which is, oh, this illusion exists, great. Thanks. Now I don't trust myself anymore, I don't know what's going on, I never trust anybody else. You can do something about them, just acknowledging they exist is a start. As we've said, technology can help us, but be mindful in the technology that you're using, it will only spot certain things for you. You have to think of yourselves differently. 
So as I said, three years ago when I started studying this, I went through a bit like the Dunning-Kruger effect. Initially thought, yeah, well, I know loads about this. Very quickly realised I didn't know a lot about this at all. And then slowly, I would say that I'm still coming up on the curve, right? I've been talking about this for three years and I still i am not an expert in it. And I don't claim to be. But we have to think of ourselves differently. And in your team scenarios, when you work with your teams now, or if you're working with stakeholders or think of it of that nature, if you know some of these illusions are there, maybe try it out on them. See whether they're actually aware that these things exist. Challenge them, challenge yourself. And the last one, just to confuse you a little bit, your intuition doesn't always deceive you. All right? So you can trust your gut feel sometimes. Just think of, obviously, the situation that you're in. So if you're gonna cross the road and you think that you can make it before there's another car come in, I don't want you, obviously, to get run over, again, whatever it is, but don't hesitate just because I've told you what these are. Still go with what your gut feel is. Just think about some of the consequences. And just to troll you a little bit further, okay, the last quote, one of my favourite quotes that come out of the book, you can make better decisions and maybe live a better life if you do your best to look for the invisible gorillas in the world around you. What happens if we just look for the gorillas? Exactly. So these are the three books that I would recommend reading if you would like to explore this further. So not only practicing this within your teams and thinking of yourself differently. The Invisible Gorilla, we've got a winner, obviously we've got two winners. Uh, thinking fast and thinking slow will help you. And then uh, Dr. Julia Shaw, that's probably my favorite one out of all of them. There's some really cool stuff in there. Um, some of her stories about how she teaches people about how you hack memories is pretty cool. So although I've said to you avoid all of these, if you're um, feeling, I don't know, a bit sadistic maybe, and you want to, uh, on them and actually get somebody else to be a victim of these, then practice some of these and uh, basically input <coughs> as many examples as you can. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to try and convince my brother that he did drink out of the bidet water. And uh, if I see you again, then maybe actually he might believe you guys. So that's it. So I've got some questions if you want. Uh, you can contact me on here and uh, I'll send these slides out to everybody and there's some references to where the images and stuff from.